Hello and welcome back to Bookish Today. I'm doing installment two of this series called uh, Poetry for Beginners that I'm doing with Kelly from Books I'm Not Reading. I'll leave a link to her channel and hopefully her video in the description section down below. But this month's poet is Sylvia Plath. Um, and I think we both found a Sylvia Plath poem that we liked. Um, Sylvia Plath is one of those tragic figure, figures from uh, American literary history or literary history. Um, she was kind of a child prodigy. Um, she was published while she was a teenager. She went to an elite college, and while she was at that elite college, she began having some serious psychological uh, depression-related issues that seemed to stem from the fact that her father had died uh, when she was around the age of eight, which caused or led to or a, or were a symptom of uh, her depression. She attempted suicide once, survived it, went on to finish uh, her degree at, at uh, Smith College, I believe. She won a fellowship to go to Cambridge um, and study, and there she met the English poet Ted Hughes. They got married, had a, I think, what could safely be described as a stormy uh, relationship. <clears throat> he was cheated on her and left her. She then embarked on a really productive uh, phase of her uh, career. But this was per productivity preceded another se severe bout of depression, which ended up with her uh, taking her own life. So the poem I chose to do is Full Fathom Five. Full Fathom Five by Sylvia Plath Old man, you surface seldom. Then you come in with the tides coming when seas wash cold, foam-capped. White hair, white beard, far-flung, a dragnet rising, falling as waves, crest and trough. Miles long extend the radial sheaves of your spread hair in which wrinkling skeins, knotted, caught, survives the old myth of origins unimaginable. You float near as keeled ice mountains of the north to be steered clear of, not fathomed. All obscurity starts with a danger. Your dangers are many. I cannot look much, but your form suffers some strange injury and seems to die, so vapors ravel to clearness on the dawn sea. The muddy rumors of your burial move me to half believe. Your reappearance proves rumor shallow, for the archaic trench lines of your grained face shed time and runnels. Ages beat like rains on the unbeaten channels of the ocean. Such sage humor, endurance, or whirlpools to make away with the groundwork of the earth and the sky's ridgepole. Waist down you may wind one labyrinthine tangle to root deep among the knuckles, shin bones, skulls. Inscrutable, below shoulders not once seen by any man who kept his head, you defy questions. You defy godhood. I walk dry on your kingdom's border, exiled to no good. Your shelled bed I remember. Father, this thick air is murderous. I would breathe water. Full Fathom Five takes its name from um, Ariel's song in Shakespeare's play, The, Temp the Tempest. Ariel is the air sprite uh, under the control of Prospero in Shakespeare's play, The Tempest. And she sings this song to Fernando, essentially telling him, that his father has died and one of the lines in the in the song that Ariel sings contains the words or contains the line full fathom five and I think clearly then it's a clear indication that this poem is in lots of ways about her father and about her interrupted relationship with her father and her continuing struggle uh, with the idea of her father's death so in those first three lines I think it'd be a clear indication that that's the case where she says, old man, you surface seldom, then you come in with the tides coming when seas wash cold, foam capped. Um, I think she's clearly here talking about her father and her memory returning, <clears throat> perhaps at moments, you know, when she doesn't necessarily want them to, uh, moments where it's not the best time for her, for her memories of her father to come back. That next set of three lines, White hair, white beard, far flung, a dragnet rising, falling as waves, crest and trough. Miles long extend the radial sheaves of your spread hair, in which wrinkling skeins, knotted, caught, survives, the old myth of origins unimaginable. So, <clears throat> to me, this description uh, of, you know, an old man with white hair spread out across the ocean uh, like a fishing net uh, indicates, and I believe this is true, that 
that she is essentially uh, equating and referencing or comparing or embodying her father as Poseidon or Neptune, the Greek Roman uh, god of the seas. This probably makes a lot of sense because uh, Neptune, Poseidon was a, I think, fairly famously cantankerous, uh, one of the Greek uh, Roman gods who was vengeful, who uh, could be incredibly uh, kind and at the same time could be an incredibly angry, could be an incredibly angry and and oftentimes vindictive presence. Uh, from what I've read of Plath's father, that's a fairly accurate description of him. He was at the very least overbearing. He was at the very least occasionally unpleasant, but also obviously capable of uh, great warmth. I also wanted to draw your attention to the lines, <clears throat> uh, a dragnet rising, falling as waves crest and trough, uh, that language of the ocean and of the actual uh, calls to mind the actual waves and the movement of the sea. I just found that to be um, a really kind of a beautiful uh, piece of writing there. The next few lines say, uh, You float near as keeled ice mountains of the north to be steered clear of, not fathomed. All obscurity starts with a danger. <clears throat> this is comparing then, I think, her memory of her father, uh, which she holds close to herself, uh, as it says in the lines there. Uh, that memory, which is a close part, an important part of who she is and her thinking, is like an iceberg. Uh, large parts of it unfathomed, unknown, um, and perhaps better off that way, that knowing more, exploring too deeply uh, her relationship with her father uh, or her father's, her memories of her father could lead to her into some dangerous territory. And then after that colon, she really kind of discusses <clears throat> that issue, that potential danger of thinking about mem remembering her father too much. She goes on to say, your dangers are many. I cannot look much, but your form suffers some strange injury and seems to die. So vapors ravel to clearness on the dawn sea. If she thinks about her memories of him too hard, then then her memory of him suffers. She, I think this indicates that she remembers some things about him that are not pleasant, some things about her that were painful, or some things about him that were painful and hurtful to her. And then her, her positive image of her uh, disappears, as she says here, um, raveled a clearness on the dawn sea. But she also is struggling with, the, with accepting his death. He was clearly an important part of her life, um, a significant person in her life with whom she kind of tied her existence perhaps some, tied some of her self-worth to. She goes on then to say in those same lines, the muddy rumors of your burial move me to half believe. Your reappearance proves rumors shallow. And then that she doesn't necessarily fully accept uh, his death or that she can't really fully accept his death. <clears throat> that it's something that she's confronted with and that no matter how often she uh, remembers and is confronted with the fact that their father is dead. She keeps having uh, these memories of him and, and in those memories he hasn't changed. She goes on to write, For the archaic trench lines of your grained face shed time in runnels. Age beats like rain on the unbeaten channels of the ocean. Such sage humor, endurance, or whirlpools to make away with groundwork of the earth and the sky's ridgepole. To me, those lines um, indicate that it's easy for her to remember him alive. It's easy for her to remember him unchanged as the way he was before her death. And, you know, easy for her to forget that he is in fact dead, that whatever it was exactly he meant to her, as a father, as a person in her life, that that's gone. And that at, that forgetting the fact that those things are gone uh, actually threaten the foundation of her life, threaten perhaps her sanity or her life altogether. And then this next section, she kind of describes a situation in which she goes back to essentially admitting that she can't know uh, everything about her father, and she doesn't know everything about her father. She goes on to write, Waist down you may wind one labyrinthine tangle to root deep among knuckles, shin bones, skulls, inscrutable below shoulders, not once seen by any man who kept his head. You defy questions. 
that there are parts of his life, parts of who he was, parts of his mind that she will never understand, that she won't understand, that essentially no one could understand until perhaps they themselves are dead. That, that line where she says, uh, but shoulders, below shoulders, not once seen by any man who kept his head, I think is clearly uh, a reference to the idea that it, perhaps in death or maybe in insanity, uh, she could understand uh, her father better. She finishes that with you with the line, you defy questions. I think it's important to note that oftentimes Poseidon, when he's depicted in works of art, um, oftentimes only appears from about the waist up and the rest of his body submerged in the sea. And I think that's what she's referencing with the idea that you can't see him uh, below his waist, that you, you can't see what the rest of his body's doing or perhaps even what the rest of his body look, looks like that it's, in effect, unknowable like that part of her father that she will never fully know. And then the last six lines are, You defy godhood. I walk dry on your kingdom's border, exiled to no good. Your shelled bed I remember. Father, this thick air is murderous. I would breathe water. There's direct reference to her feeling that she has been separated from her father unfairly, um, that she remembers his death, I believe, when she says, your shelled bed, I remember, I think she's talking about his coffin, which is, after all, uh, coffins are vaguely uh, shell-shaped. And then she says, Father, this thick air is murderous. And I think she clearly means by that that life is killing her. Um, and then she closes by saying, I would breathe water, in which I think she's indicating that if she could know him better, if she could be reunited with him, if she could have him back and to know more about him that she would die to be able to do that. So, you know, uh, Sylvia Plath is oftentimes referred to as confessional uh, poet. I've been told that by uh, my uh, kind of my poetry mentor in this, which is Jason from Old Blues Chapter and Verse, that she's a confessional poet. Um, there's definitely a fair amount of self-absorption here, and a lot of people don't enjoy the self-absorption of her poetry. And I can see that. You know, I, not all the Plath poems I read did I enjoy, but this one really, I thought the imagery and the language really resonated with me. And I thought it was a really powerful poem, essentially about loss and the loss of someone important to you and how that could really affect you. And I think that's what Plath is talking about. And, you know, uh, I think part of the reason why the poem today seems morbid, those last few lines, you know, this thick air is murderous, I would breathe water, that those lines seem particularly morbid or gruesome to us today because we do know that Plath committed suicide. That Anyway, there's my take on Full Fathom 5 by Sylvia Plath. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, like I said, be sure to check out Kelly's uh, at Books I'm Not Reading, her uh, Poetry for Beginners uh, video about Sylvia Plath. I believe she's reading or concentrating on the poem Daddy by Sylvia Plath. Anyway, like I said, thanks for watching. Let me know what you think in the comments.